Hello, I'm Cynthia Sinclair, and you are watching Finding Respect in the Chaos here on Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'm here with Ken Yabusaki and Ann Yabusaki. These guys are super amazing in working with people that are dealing with fetal alcohol syndrome disorders. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's needs to be unpacked in all that. But yeah. first, if you wouldn't mind, would you guys give us, how about if you end first, give okay. us a little bit of history about who you are and how you got involved in this. Sure, sure. Um, I'm a psychologist and family therapist. And I had, um, I've been, I worked a lot of years on the mainland, but I am from Hawaii. And I returned from, to Hawaii about 15 years ago, 15, 20 years? 20 it? years. Yeah. We returned together to take care of my parents. And so, but in coming back, I was asked to create a clinical program. And the clinical program had a, the first contract was to work with juvenile drug court here in Oahu. Okay. So this, um, this was a challenge, and this was something that I'm passionately in, interested about anyway. So we did take the contract, and that was back in early 2000. As the contract progressed, and as I saw families from that program, there were things that were not happening that were, they were not, I'm not used to having families not respond. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this was challenging, and I felt really pulled to find out, well, what, what was I not doing wrong? What was I missing? Mm -hmm. And these families were great families. To work. So I began, I heard about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, fetal alcohol syndrome, and I began to study it more. So over the last maybe 15, 20 years, I've been looking at this phenomenon and what is it? How does it work? What do we do about it? And how can we give these families some hope? Hope, oh, that's always the key, yeah. right? To help people get further down the road. And I understand you are a biochemical engineer, is that right? Uh, Wait, no, biochemical? Biochemist. Biochemist, excuse me. Close. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about you, Ken, if you would, please. Yeah, I'm a retired biochemist, and I became interested in uh, FASD through... Anne's involvement uh, in her work with the juvenile drug court, in which she kind of shared with me some of the uh, problems she was having, not problems, but her observations of mm -hmm. children, uh, even adults, uh, with uh, FASD. And so I said, wow, I'm wondering why she was having these, the issues these people were having. So I did my own research and, and tried to understand the biochemistry what was going on in terms of FASD. And to this day, all the research that has been done with, it, with FASD, there's really no known mechanism. But the one thing that is very prevalent is that there is permanent brain damage. Oh, wow. Permanent not, you can't fix it, it's done. Right. So if right. you are damaged as a baby, then yeah. um, it's for life? You've got these issues yes. in yes. your brain for life? Correct. Yeah. Wow. Well, and as the brain develops, though, you know, you might be able to grasp more and do more things. And mm -hmm. so there's always development along that line, but, um, but there will always be challenges, you know. Sure. And, and we call it a spectrum disorder because those with the more severe disabilities are on one end, fetal alcohol syndrome, all the way to those who are less impaired. Mm -hmm. So each individual is different. Sure, and that's the way it is with everything, right? Yeah. We all, we, yeah react to trauma differently, we react to mm -hmm. um, chemicals differently, That's everybody's right. body is just a little bit different. I think our first slide talks about the program that you guys have, which is the Hawaii <coughs> FASD Action Group. And now tell us a little bit about that and how that got started. Well, I got frustrated. <laughs> I guess that's the first step. <laughs> I said, I am sure this is, I'm not alone in this. And so I looked for other people who were dealing with this. And I just sent out an email to friends and say, hey, and then parents that I knew that I was working with their children, can we get together and, and let's look for resources? Let's, the problem is there weren't any resources. And I didn't know where to find resources for my families and for my kids. And so I said, we got to create it. Let's, let's, let's work together and do this. So now we have about 150 people who have joined. Wow. And we have a listserv, and we, we're trying to do our best as volunteers. We're all volunteers on how to get the word out, how to create services, and yes. that's what the Action Group is about. And I'm so glad you guys have come on the show today to sort of help get that word out. Thank you. Um, because Thank it you. is such an important thing 
And it's something that can change. I mean, you can make a difference, right? When you, I agree. When you try to intervene in the early stages of these things, is it possible to make a difference? Like, mm -hmm. if say someone drinks all the time and they find out they're pregnant mm -hmm. um, and they quit, would that make a difference in how much the baby would be affected? Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little on that one, sure. Ken? Well, I don't think that any um, woman intentionally wants to harm a child in any way. And unfortunately, the uh, stigma that's placed on women who drink and then end up with a baby with FASD or FAS, there's a tremendous amount of guilt there. So um, yeah. we're, we're trying to reach out to those who have this particular issue that it's, it's really not their fault because they didn't know. Yeah. Right. And these kids can yeah. function, right? Yes. Because of the, if we make accommodations for them. Yeah. Oh, right. So, okay. so, like, you know, if someone is blind, we, we help them with a blind dog or a dog right. assisted living. Uh, if, they're, if they can't walk, we give them a wheelchair or cane or uh, crutches. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about is making accommodations for these children and these right. adults so they can function. And they sure. Can. Yeah. What a difference that must make, too, then, for them and for the guilt levels from the parents, yes. too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge difference. When you did your research, um, did you do, like, chemical research on how the brain is affected by alcohol? Or how, can you give us a few more details on that? Sure. Uh, when you think about what's happening uh, with uh, prenatal exposure to alcohol, the developing fetus very, is very vulnerable. And, and therefore, um, you have to understand that when alcohol uh, is broken down, when, when a, a woman, let's say, that is pregnant ingests alcohol, the alcohol is broken down into two chemicals. The first chemical is very poisonous. And then that poisonous chemical is cleared or detoxified further into a harmless uh, chemical. But the problem is, is that that clearing or detoxification process is genetically determined. So if you don't have a particular uh, clearing mechanism, and these are enzymes that do this in the liver, uh, that um, uh, you're going to build up this toxic substance, and then that is the one that will. Uh, have the effects on the developing brain of the fetus. So it's a kind of a thing in the liver then that kind yes. of determines yes. how much you're going to be affected or not? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. okay. And so the, a child, uh, let's say a fetus that's developing, the brain is developing, is exposed to this particular poison that I mentioned, and that's converted from the first enzyme. It actually uh, involves inhibition mm -hmm. of making oh, cracks within the brain. In other words, the brain is made up of billions of neurons or nerve cells connected to each other. And this particular sub, uh, toxic substance called acetaldehyde actually interferes with the development of intact mm -hmm. tracts. Big, big words, wait, say that again for me, please. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. my brain's a little slow. Mm -hmm. well, you know, no. Maybe we what? can go to that slide. Yeah, I think we could, but okay. I don't know. Um, we okay. have to go down to slide three or four if we can. I don't even know if we can get there. I don't know uh, if we can the change one. the order oh, once okay. we start. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, here That's we go. Good. The effects of pre, uh, prenatal alcohol mm -hmm. exposure. This is sure. perfect. This right. is exactly what we were just talking about anyway. So mm -hmm. um, so it, in, it affects the entire body, not just the brain? Yes. Because the brain is attached to the whole body, yes. So when it says mostly invisible, so... It's not something you would see, like you could talk to somebody or go to school with them, you wouldn't even know. Right. Think. So it's not something that people need to be ashamed of, right? It's not like, because right. not everybody's going to know about that. Exactly. So that's kind of, I would think shame is, is always a big thing Isn't that it? kind of destroys people's ability to be resilient, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. shame just sort of inhibits all of that. Mm -hmm. And so if we can kind of maybe get rid of some of that shame, too, that would help. Absolutely. And... Only about 10%. There are some facial features that can occur. If a woman drinks between, they found out, day 19 and 21 of their pregnancy, that some of the facial features, when it's the facial features of the fetus is developing, can be affected. And it's That's very specific interesting. in those two yeah, days' time? Uh, in the, in, 
I was, wow. re I was reading about that and I thought, oh my goodness. And so what happens is that if it's only 10%, then 90% of people have no facial features. They interact like we do. Their IQs are, you know, for the most part, are okay. It's the functioning level. They have difficulty with, say, um, well, we can talk about more about that later, but they have difficulties that are masks that are invisible. I it's see. like having brain damage, and you were perfectly functioning one day, and the next day, you know, you're, you're not, you're not, right. and you and you can't see it. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I've had a couple of severe head concussions in my life, oh. and um, same thing. I had so I had concussive syndrome for almost yeah. a whole year after oh. a, yeah. a car accident that I was in. Yes. And nobody can see you. Right. Even the doctors. When I was living in the south, for one thing, and the <laughs> doctors aren't so swift down there, but. Um, these like there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with you i'm like well, there's something wrong with me i can't think straight i'm that's tired all the time i'm right. like you know dizzy and fuzzy headed and i'm not like this usually so yes. what and finally i got to a doctor that said no Wonderful. this is concussive syndrome that's exactly you have a classic case of it and i thought i saw five doctors and not one of them knew that oh my yes. so it's like yeah you, but you don't know you could look at like the doctors looked at me and said, right. you're fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> right. And no, you I'm know not. there's something wrong. You know, you know there's something going on. Right. And the kids, um, they were born this way. So sometimes it takes, to, it takes a knowledgeable person to say, have you had these oh, symptoms? Right. Do, you know, I noticed you have difficulty with memory. Um, what's it like for you? And, and talks more slowly because it's harder to process information. Right. So I speak more slowly to them, and, and it's very much like that, but they don't know it because they didn't know what it would be like without it. Oh, right. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Sure, that yeah. makes total sense, yeah. too. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we've got another slide that we can show. Okay. Um, one last slide that oh, we yeah, were just was... talking about this a little bit, <clears throat> yeah. um, and then we'll go to break right after we talk about this. Okay. This is what you were just talking about, how the brain gets off the track. Is, yeah, is that what you were talking actually, about, sort Actually, um, i like to say maybe that the brain is involved with all behavior, all human behavior. It begins in the brain, all our senses, executive functioning, thinking, reasoning, all our feelings end up with specific behaviors. Now, the behaviors are either ones that you can change and then some behaviors you can't change. Mm -hmm. So in the situation of FASD, we're talking about a situation where, as I mentioned, the formation of these tracks through the nerve cells are either intact or either disrupted in some way or not incomplete or not complete. Wow. And so you end up with, if you, a specific behavior is a train that can go smoothly on the track to reach its destination, or one in which it gets derailed because the tracks are incomplete. Okay. And therefore, you end up with behaviors that cannot be changed. Okay, so that yeah. makes sense. Okay, yeah. listen, we got to take a break. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay. I hope you guys will stay with us. Don't go anywhere. Aloha, my name is Victoria and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, see you soon. Mahalo. Hey, aloha everyone, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Hi, welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and I am here with Ann Yabusaki and Ken Yabusaki from the Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Disorders. No, it's the Hawaii FASD Group. Action, right, action Group. Action Group. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Sorry. I can't keep them all. All the names in my head. Sorry. Um, we've got another slide I'd like to show um, that talks about how um, the, a, the FASD is underestimated. Yes. Could you talk to us a little bit more about how and what happens with that when it's underestimated like that? Okay. 
Well, first of all, we talked a little bit about how you know you had a concussive syndrome, you looked fine, and, and yet you knew that the brain was not quite functioning, mm -hmm. and you knew something was wrong. Well, that's how it's presented often. So they might take a symptom, a, a diagnostician, a doctor, or a psychologist might take some of that symptom and say, oh, you must have ADHD, meaning that attention deficit disorder. That's why you're so impulsive. Okay, so we'll, we'll treat you with a little bit of, you know, we'll send you to a psychiatrist and see if maybe some medication might help. Or someone might say, I think you have autism because those symptoms are like autism. So many of the symptoms of FASD embrace these other symptoms, learning okay. disabilities. And if the clinician is not cued in to FASD, they're going to miss the whole diagnosis. And sure. many kids and many clinicians are not. Um, aware of this right and and it's not taught in graduate schools and it's not no and oh dear and you would think it would be that's kind of a common thing. I, know. I mean it's not it's, common but it's it's common it's, enough to yeah. know you're gonna hit it at Ex some point in your your, your professional career yeah sure yeah. yeah so is there any link between and I know I was reading something this week about this um, is there a link between autism and FASD do they yes is yeah. there a link yeah. yes Yes, in fact, uh, studies have shown that FASD can produce symptoms or characteristics of autism, okay. just from the alcohol yeah. exposure prenatally. But, and so it's all about the developing brain. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, yes. So they could treat autism mm -hmm. and get it wrong. And one thing I should mention yeah. is that in the developing fetus, when the pregnant woman uh, is uh, drinking, Metabolize uh, alcohol, as I said, creates a poison, affects the v developing brain in terms of making intact neurons uh, connections. Um, the other thing is, is that the baby, is, as it develops, is going to develop its own liver, and the same alcohol is going to be oh. metabolized. So we're talking about yeah. the blood volume of a, an adult is quite large, and so the amount of alcohol in there, or the toxin, is quite dilute. But a baby, and being a very small entity at the time as a fetus, is going to be, have a larger concentration effect. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And then we talk a little bit about binge drinking and, and you know, just <laughs> uh, drinking maybe two or three glasses of wine or whatever a uh, week. What's the difference between okay, the two? Binge drinking would be at least four drinks at a time. Oh. And many women are beginning, uh, have, some women have reported that. So it gets... The concentration during a binge drink is different from a concentration to just one glass of wine. Okay. When we think about it, yeah, that's what Ken and I were thinking about. It's like, holy, you know, this is different. Well, I can remember <clears throat> when I was pregnant with my uh -huh. kids. Yeah. That I mean, I went, and this is you know, thirty-five years ago now. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, but you know, and the doctor said to me, as I said, you know, I drink wine. I like to drink my wine with yeah. dinner and stuff. Should I stop drinking? It's, you know, before all these, this research had come out and stuff, right? right. He's, oh, yeah, no, it's fine. Go yes. ahead. And I'm like, oh, it didn't seem right to me somehow. <laughs> but, you know, and I thought, wow, okay. Because that's how, that's how far, though, the mentality has changed from yes. 30 years ago to today. Yeah. We really know the specific effects yes. on that developing brain. Yes. Yeah. That's wild to think about between 19 isn't, and 21. Isn't it that, interesting? That yeah. day, just those three days or two days time yeah. of yeah. making that huge difference in their lives. A wow. lot of the, and I wanted to point out that, you know, a lot of the kids from foster care come from, substance abusing families. Sure. And so when you see foster care or adopted children, you wonder about their past. And so 85% in one small sample was misdiagnosed. 85%? That's huge. Yeah. And that, that's, um, you know, and, and that's why we're hoping that CWS, you know, Child Welfare Services and Protective Services will take a look at their population and try to educate their foster parents. Uh, it's going to be tough on foster parents, too. Sure it will. Wow. Yeah, right. And adoptive parents. And you want to know what's exactly. in your child's past so that you can understand how best to help them and exactly. how best to you know, give yeah. them a, so a, lot a of, normal sort of life. Right. Yeah. Then in, in um, just last year, there was a, a, um, a study across the United States with 6,500 first graders. 6,500 first graders were assessed clinically assessed for FASD. 
and one in 20 first graders came out with uh, affected by F and FASD. Huge. That's one in every classroom. Yeah, that's at least one in every classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we were, <sighs> we were startled by these statistics, and this was just done in 2018. So the United States is a little bit behind in getting their research out. So we're we are. Who are we behind in? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. We are. You'd think we'd be ahead of everybody, but no, we're no. behind. Figures. Okay. Shoots. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't like the idea that no, as in America no, no. we are behind these things. Yeah. When we have the best researchers, the best biochemists, mm -hmm. the best all of this, and yet we still are behind. Wow. Yeah, Canada, for example, has made progression in their programming and policies before. And we're trying to copy them a little bit. <laughs> Do you know that Ken, when I was on my trip around the world, um, we were talking about yeah, this a yeah, while ago, yeah. right? Um, when I was studying the way different cultures deal with domestic violence mm -hmm. and all that, um, Canada has that, the lowest incidence of domestic violence and mm -hmm. child abuse of any country in the world. Wow. And so I went there to see why. <laughs> you know, what are you guys doing? And I was really surprised. What it is is they don't have laws, at least this is my opinion anyway, mm -hmm. as to why maybe, but they don't have specific laws against domestic violence and child abuse. It's just assault. They oh. have progressive things that are embedded mm -hmm. into the law to yeah. help people that are child abuse victims or domestic yes. violence victims yes. Yes. so that the, you know, the outcome is different for mm -hmm. them to be more protected. Mm -hmm. But it's still assault. It's just assault. There's no, I mean, it, and I thought that was pretty cool. I thought, wow, maybe that's the, that's a it's not something solution. separate, you know, it's yeah. not. A different thing. It is assault. It's abuse. It's, right. Yeah. So, wow. So, how does this um, how does this compare with say like I know there's a lot of ice and um, uh, methamphetamine that happens here in Hawaii. Well, mm -hmm. actually, everywhere in the whole country nowadays, yeah. right? Right. Um, but so, how does what's the difference? Because I know um, I've worked with a few girls that have lost their babies because their babies mm -hmm. were born addicted. Yeah. And so they. They take the babies away. Yes. What what kind of effects are in uh, with all of that too? Is that the same or is it different? Is it? I mean, I know it affects the brain and yes, that'll be bad. Oh, it, it's different. Yeah, and yeah. has yeah. been looking at that a yeah. little bit more um, too. Uh, drugs like methamphetamines, cocaine, heroin affect the brain differently when uh, a, a fetus is developing. Uh, what happens in that case is the actual brain there's receptors on the brain that um, receptive to those drugs, but the tracks that, as I mentioned, that are formed, like train tracks, uh, are normally developed. The neuronal connections are there, but the but the receptors on the brain to those drugs uh, don't affect that particular making of the track. So you're going to have a baby who you've heard of crack babies that come out. Right. They're they're wired. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's because the the, the drug has affected the brain on the receptor, but the tracks are there. So therefore, in terms of reasoning, um, you can still reason. But in a case where a baby that's been affected by prenatal exposure to alcohol, as I mentioned, the tracks are derailed or not formed. And therefore, oh, okay. that's why you have the behaviors that can't be changed. You can help a person that has been, a baby that has been exposed to how can you? What, what are some of the specific things that you can do? I know there's a slide we've got about how it takes a village and stuff, yeah, and some yeah. of the things that we can specifically do mm -hmm. um, to try to help these kids yeah. and, and stuff. So what is there medicines? Well, and what? Well, they come in from different, different ways. They could come in from mental health um, agency. They could come in through substance abuse agencies. They come through the criminal justice system. You know, the thing that, that it, and they could be, and they're largely at schools. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is to understand the disorder, what, what they're struggling with, and try to accommodate them. I have, um, uh, for example, one child that was uh, having difficulty going from one classroom to another. She would be bumping into people as everybody rushed through high school, mm -hmm. you know, from one class to another. Right. Well, it was because sensitivity of her, she couldn't um, gauge her her uh, people around her, she had impaired ability to do that. So what the teachers did was before the class changed to another class, they would tell her to go to your next class. 
She didn't have to go through the crowded hallways. Exactly. She could just go. Exactly. Okay. And then people didn't think she was trying to pick a fight because she was bumping into you. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Um, some, we have little ones uh, that might need more rest. They might need, uh, their brain is being so stressed. And so what I've seen some teachers do in the classroom is to just take those kids aside and say, would you like to just lie down and, and do your work in a prone position rather than at a desk? Making those accommodations. Um, if you want to, teaching them um, distance. And so one teacher did a, a straight line teaching them, them distance, first graders. And she would put, said, now you stand on that line, and then she'd put cross lines like a tra train track, and this is where you stand, just so that the children get a sense of distance and proportion. Right. And then um, in juvenile drug court, for example, we would say, okay, kid. You didn't do this or that, or come home at curfew. Okay. <laughs> You're going to be, we're going to put you back in jail, so to speak. You know, it's a detention right, home, right. you know, and it's a safe place. But he didn't belong there, you know. Right. And so what we did was to say, maybe we don't need that. What we need is to give them a time out. But then they would come back and we, we make accommodations mm -hmm. that they wouldn't um, have to be at a certain place at a certain time. But at least communicate with us, teach them communication. Right. I think we've got one last slide, and I know we're almost out of time. Yeah, yep, so yep. I'm like, oh, there's <laughs> so much more to say. You guys are going to have to come back again another time <laughs> really? and give us updates and stuff on how your program is going and what's going Thank on you. with it. And let's go back to that last slide, though, before we take it away too far, because okay. I'd like you to kind of point out some of the things that are on yeah. here. This was, um, we have a, a monitoring system that is across the nation. And what what we found was um, pulling out the data that pregnancy and alcohol trends are, are high and they're increasing. Over 2000, in 2000, it was 4.8. In 2015, it's now 8.7% of the women who wow. endorse that they have been drinking during pregnancy or during the third part of their pregnancy. So it doesn't mean that every pregnancy, that everybody endorsed it. So this might be an underestimated, what we call a conservative estimate. Right, because people aren't always going to want to admit it exactly. because they know that what they did exactly. was wrong. And, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh, I'm so grateful that you guys came in. I really Thank am, you. and I think this is Thank such you. an important thing because we can make differences. Like these kids that are, you know, getting stamped with delinquent titles yes. when they really aren't. There's nothing. There aren't. They've got good hearts. They just right. are are misunderstood. Yes. And you know, and that's so for the for the parents out there, for the kids out there. Reach out. There is help for you. The Hawaii FASD Action, action Group. Thank you. I knew I was going to forget action again. I'm like, wait, wait. <laughs> but yeah. definitely look them up. Find out. Get the information that you need to really make a difference for your life. I'm Cynthia Sinclair, and I'm really glad that you guys joined us today. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos on ThinkTechHawaii.com. Please come back next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.